People ask me, what's your desert island food? Bread and butter. There's like no greater food than that. So good. Hi everyone, I'm Claire Saffitz. I'm so excited to be back in the NYT cooking studio for more episodes of Try This at Home. And today I am making classic French baguette. This is a bread that many people think has to be bought in a bakery, but making baguette at home is actually such a fun project. The ingredient list could not be simpler. Overall, it is an incredibly satisfying and delicious home baking project. To make a pretty good baguette at home actually is pretty doable. To make like an amazing, incredible, technically perfect baguette at home, much trickier and takes some practice. But as a first timer, you can get a really good result. And then the more you make it, the more you can kind of fine tune your technique and really kind of like dial it in. But as sort of a first time bread baker, you're gonna get a result that I think is gonna really impress you. The recipe makes three sort of mid-sized baguette. And so in all my testing, I was like literally handing my neighbors like warm bread from the oven. And it's like the look on their faces was just that's gonna make you wanna make more. What I think will be surprising to some people who've never made baguette before is how incredibly simple the ingredient list is. You can truly find everything you need, which is only three ingredients, at any grocery store. So you don't need starter, this is not a sourdough recipe. Where you might need to invest a little bit more time and energy is in sourcing some equipment that you'll need. The main thing that you'll need is something called a baguette transfer peel. Sometimes it's called a flipping peel, but it is basically a very thin piece of wood. You could substitute something like a really thin cutting board for this. I did eventually wind up going to like a local hardware store and having them cut a piece of plywood for me. You can buy something called like a baguette transfer peel, but this costs like $3. Basically, this is gonna help you move the baguette once they're shaped and proofed to like transfer to the oven because you have this like long, skinny, super delicate piece of dough. So this is really important, super helpful. The next piece of equipment I'm gonna talk about, you don't really have to have. It is helpful, it will improve the shape and look of your baguette. This is what's called a baker's couche or a linen couche. And this is used for proofing the baguette once they're shaped. And it does help to give it a really nice, regular, long shape. It tends not to stick as much to the dough as like a cotton cloth. Another thing that I really strongly recommend you invest in is a baking stone. A baking stone is a piece of ceramic or stoneware that you put in the oven and it becomes a baking surface. So it retains heat, it helps to kind of radiate heat outward. And lots of bread bakers bake on a baking stone because it just tends to give you really nice oven spring and really even baking all the way around. In addition to having your transfer peel, it's useful to have a flat, piece of wood that is gonna be used for proofing. I was already at the hardware store and just had them cut me another piece of wood. This is just really useful for transferring the baguette to the oven. If you don't wanna get that, you could just use a rimless baking sheet like this one. Let's talk about another piece of equipment. This is what's called a lame, which just means blade in French. This is used to slash the loaves. So when you slash bread, you create these slits in it. You're basically telling the bread where it should expand in the oven. And it's just super sharp. You could just use a razor blade. In a pinch, you can use like a sharp serrated knife, but a lame, especially for baguette, which is sort of a soft, wet dough, having a designated lame is really, really helpful. Okay, so let's get into making the baguette. <laughs> so a poulish is sort of in bread parlance, a type of pre-ferment. Basically, a pre-ferment is where you take some amount of you know, flour and water that's been pre-fermented, basically. So that could be in the form of starter, that could be poolish, or something called a biga, which is like an Italian style that's stiffer. But basically, it is a portion of the flour and water in the recipe. We're gonna mix with the yeast and let it ferment. Anytime you're doing bread, you're gonna to wanna to use a kitchen scale. It's really important that we're very accurate as far as measuring all the ingredients, which are just yeast, flour, salt, water, because these proportions are really important. Each type of bread sort of has a temperature at which everything is optimal. Like the yeast and bacteria that are in there are gonna like be at their most active and you're gonna kind of get the best development of the dough. And it's usually pretty warm. For baguette, it's somewhere between like 75 and 80-ish. So you just wanna make sure that you're using water that is sort of in that range. My water right now is at 82. I'm gonna say that that's fine because when I pour it, it's gonna cool off a little bit. So I have my scale on zero. I'm gonna add water. Unless your yeast is really old or it's been improperly stored, it's fine. You just wanna take the time to dissolve it a little bit. If you're using instant yeast, you can just mix everything together. It doesn't really need that time to dissolve. So it's equal weight, flour and water. 
In all American recipes, we give volume measurements and then often weight. And so for this recipe, we actually switched it where we give weights and then volume because I want to emphasize the weight aspect and then I want to encourage people to use a scale. Because when you're measuring flour, of all ingredients, flour is sort of the most variable. You get different weights using the same measurement. So it's like my cup of flour is going to be different than your cup of flour at home. Weighing is by far the most accurate method. And also it's like cleaner. You can just dump everything into one container. I'm mixing everything together just right inside this container, just getting all those ingredients combined and hydrating all the flour. So you have this kind of like thick, sticky paste. That's what you want. I'm going to cover it. And I'm going to use this to mark on the side of the container that kind of like level of my poolish. So think of this as the kind of commercial yeast equivalent of sourdough starter. So I have my little piece of tape, I have my Sharpie, and I'm just going to kind of look at where the top of it is and make a mark right there on the side. And I'm going to let this sit out at room temperature until it's tripled in volume and the surface is going to have tons of these like little soapy looking bubbles. It will be a little bit domed and like it's on the verge of collapse if you were to shake it. So that's how you know you're at the point where you want to use the poolish at 75 Fahrenheit. It'll take around six hours. So I designed this recipe so that you could start the poolish in the morning, the day before you want to bake. Have that go, you know, for most of the morning and afternoon. You can make the dough kind of in late afternoon or evening, throw it in the fridge, bake the next day. So it's kind of designed for flexibility around your schedule. So fast forward several hours, our poolish is ready. And in fact, full disclosure, I set this up earlier and I was really trying to time everything perfectly for this video. The poolish went a little over. This one actually went a little too far. You can see that there's like a high water mark where it rose and then fell. So that's okay, I'm still gonna use it. It's not that far gone. First thing I wanna do is scrape this into a large bowl. You might wonder like, well, why wouldn't you just make the poolish in the bowl itself? You absolutely could, but it's so much easier to judge the readiness in a smaller container like this. Then to this, I'm going to add my water. So when we're making bread and we're talking about hydration, it's talking about the proportion of, of water to flour. So here with 500 grams of flour, I'm doing 375 grams of water. If I just pretend like everything is 500 grams equals 100%, then that equals 75% water. So 75% hydration baguette is like fairly standard. So it just means that the dough is gonna be a little bit soft and sticky, but I feel like that 75% is kind of like a sweet spot for baguette. Using water in that temperature range of around 75 to 80. So again, instant read thermometer, super helpful for this process. So I'm going to basically dissolve the poolish in this water, and this just makes it easier to incorporate the poolish into the flour. So now I'm gonna add a little bit more yeast to really kind of like activate the dough in addition to the yeast that's in the poolish. And again, I'm adding this directly to the water so it can have a little bit of a head start and dissolve. All-purpose flour is really a great flour for making baguette, and it's wonderful because it's like so accessible. You probably already have all-purpose flour at home. Generally speaking, with most breads, the baker percentage of salt is 2%. So it's 2% by weight relative to the flour. Now I'm gonna mix it all together. You can use a flexible spatula, which is perfectly fine. I like to use, this is called a bowl scraper. It is literally for like scraping around the side of a bowl. And it's just like a super handy bread tool, kind of acts as an extension of your hand and helps to keep your hands clean because obviously like you touch water, you touch flour, it gets all sticky. So now I have everything pretty well incorporated. If you are like an avid sourdough baker or just bake a lot of bread at home, it's gonna be maybe a little bit different than what you're used to, just because it's a different style. So we're actually going for something that's a little bit underdeveloped, and I'm gonna talk about why. But for mixing, because this is a wet dough, I do it by hand. I like to just use one hand and then hold the bowl with the other, and I'm a lefty, so I'm gonna go in with my left hand. And it's a really simple motion. You're just grasping the dough kind of off to one side, lifting it up and pressing it back into the center. So I don't want to knead this on the surface because it's too wet and sticky, so I'm keeping it inside the bowl and rotating as I work with my clean hand. So you're just lifting up from one side, rotating the bowl and pressing the dough back down. As you continue to mix, what you're doing is you're getting all that flour really hydrated and those proteins in the flour are mixing with the water to produce gluten, which are these like stretchy strands that give bread and so many other baked goods their structure. So this step is really developing gluten, which is another way of sort of like building strength in the dough. It's starting to feel a little stronger. It's feeling a little bit more elastic, which means it kind of wants to spring back onto itself a little bit. 
So what I'm looking for, how I know I don't need to mix anymore, is the dough will still be pretty sticky. It's going to have this kind of textured look, but it is going to firm up slightly, and it is also going to give me a little bit more resistance when I try to lift it up and fold it back onto itself. And that usually takes about five minutes. You could mix this in a stand mixer bowl, plug it into the mixer with the hook on just the lowest speed because you don't need really like vigorous mixing at this point. Okay, I'm feeling good about where this is. I think I'm about done. So you can see I have like lots of sticky dough in this hand, but I have a clean hand and I have my scraper so I can kind of use this to get any little bits of dough off of my hand and back into the bowl. We're done mixing. You could leave this in the bowl for, for bulk fermentation, but it is helpful to have a different container like this one. So this is called a Cambro. This is like a food service container that's very common in restaurant kitchens. You'll see a lot of bread bakers using containers like this. It is really useful for gauging how that dough is kind of rising, very similar to the idea of like what I did here with the poolish. So it has these markings on it. It's like just so much easier to tell how much it's grown in a container like this versus the bowl. Because this dough is still really sticky, as you can see, it's helpful to kind of prime the vessel you're using for bulk fermentation, either with a little bit of water or even the tiniest bit of like neutral oil. What I wanna do at this point is pat it down into a single layer so that I can have a good sense of like where, it, where the level is. You can use your scraper for that. Okay, then I'll throw the lid on it. This camera lids never fit. Why is it called bulk fermentation? The word bulk refers to the idea that we have this whole mass of dough that's actually gonna become many different loaves. So we're gonna like divide it out and we're doing the whole mass together. So that's where bulk comes from. Then fermentation is just referring to that process where the yeast that we added is sort of starting to feed on the carbohydrates in the flour and produce gas as a byproduct. So it's gonna raise that dough up and make it super airy and bubbly. So we get baguette and that's like the fermentation part. So I like to do the same thing that I did with the poolish, which is to mark that level on the container. Just put like a little piece of tape and then kind of get down an eye level. It's not super level at this point, so you can just sort of eyeball it. I feel like it's here. It's just gonna help me sort of like gauge how it's rising. For the bulk fermentation stage, the first thing we're gonna do is just let it sit for an hour. And so during that hour, it's gonna like really hydrate. That gluten development is gonna happen sort of on its own. And we're gonna give that yeast a chance to really start to like activate. So after an hour, we're gonna come back and I'll show you that series of folds. The baguette dough has been hanging out in bulk fermentation for about an hour. So now it's time to do that first series of folds, which I'm gonna show you. Based on that marking, it's grown just a little bit, not very much, so that sort of rise is gonna accelerate from here on out. I have a little bit of water here because dough is less likely to stick to a wet hand. I think people think like, for dough not to stick, you should use flour, but sometimes water, if it's like already wet, is a great tool. So a little bit here with a wet hand, pull the dough up, stretching it, and then just let it fall onto itself. If you get any sticking around the edges, just scrape it off and put it back on. 90 degree turn. I did that on one side. Now I'm gonna do the next. Reaching down underneath, grasping it, pulling it up, folding it onto itself. Already you can see such a difference in the way the dough is sort of holding its shape. And now again, on the third side, folding up, stretching it over. Now on the fourth side, the dough, it feels smoother, it feels stronger. And I often like to give it sort of one last like little nice kind of fold where I go on both sides and really kind of get the whole thing out of the container. Now it's this like cute little bundle. I'm starting to see some bubbles, some gas production underneath, which is good. And it's starting to get that little bit of a wobble. So I know that it's sort of aerating. So now that we're like well underway with bulk fermentation, I'm gonna come back every 30 minutes and do that same series of folds. This is ready to go into the fridge where it can rest for anywhere between 12 and 24 hours before baking. It's baking day, even though it's the same day. Pretend like it's the next day because we've left this dough overnight. I set up this dough yesterday. 
refrigerated it. You can see that it has basically doubled in size. I have my original marker right here. I also put the time, by the way, because it's good to like have a record of like when bulk fermentation started and so you can kind of gauge its growth. So this was at 5 p.m. last night when I started bulk. It grew to about 50% and now it's just been chilling and it's ready to go. When you pull your dough out of the fridge the next day, and again, there's lots of flexibility here. You could do a 12 hour rest, you could do a 24 hour rest. So you can really kind of bake at any point that following day. That's again, part of sort of how I designed the recipe for maximum flexibility. We waited for it to have sort of that 50% growth before we put it in the fridge. And it may or may not have achieved that like doubling in size as it chilled in the fridge. So it kind of depends on like the temperature of the dough when it was going in, the temperature of your fridge, if you've like opened and closed it a million times. For the first time, mine actually did basically double by the time I pulled it out of the fridge. But when I was making like all the tests, I think like my fridge was more empty and it was colder and I wasn't quite getting that full like doubling during that cold rise. So if that's the case, just pull out your dough and let it sit at room temperature until you see it reach that like doubled point. And that only usually takes, I would say at most like an hour, hour and a half. So we're gonna move into the next step, which is called pre-shaping. So the shaping process for baguette is very important. This is the most challenging part of the recipe. Everything up until this point, I think is like super easy and doable for beginners. So I'll show you kind of a process that I think makes it doable. Just know that the first couple times you shape your baguette, you might not get that like beautiful classic shape. You can see that the surface of the dough is bubbly and it's super smooth. It's puffy. You can actually see this gluten matrix. You can see these kind of like stretchy lines running across the surface. So this dough looks great. The shaping process is really kind of a two-step process. We have the pre-shape and then the final shape. The first thing I wanna do is divide this. So we're making three baguettes. I'm gonna give the surface a little bit of flour. I'm gonna weigh the portions just to make sure they're equal. You don't really have to, but it is gonna give you that like uniform baguette look. I'm gonna flour my hands really well. This dough is still a little bit sticky. I'm gonna scrape it down the sides and let it kind of pull itself out of its container. I'm gonna start to divide the dough. So I'm just sort of eyeballing a third. It's about 330 grams per portion, like, you know, give or take. So that's 334, that's pretty good. Four, close enough. Okay, now I'm gonna move into pre-shaping. So pre-shaping is where you are helping to start to organize the dough into the shape it's going to ultimately be. Because right now it's like sort of all over the place and it doesn't have a lot of structure or tension to it. So here's what we're gonna do. Make sure you're working on not a heavily floured surface, but like an evenly floured surface. So I have a little bit of flour on one hand. Work the dough into a bit of a square, as much of a square as you can get it. So about like a six by six inch square. I'm gonna roll it up into a cylinder and I'm gonna roll it toward me. And the general motion for all of the shaping is to kind of bring the dough toward you. It's just an easier way to handle it, I think. I'm rolling it and then pushing it out a little bit onto itself to help build that tension because it's that tension that is going to ultimately produce the most evenly shaped baguette with like the nicest oven spring. It's resting on that seam so that seam seals. So I'm gonna grab this portion. So same thing, you can use sort of a little bit of flour on your hands to help pat it out, kind of working it into this square shape and now bringing it toward you and rolling it into this cylinder shape, letting it rest on that seam. Sometimes I use the scraper to kind of push it along, make sure that it's really sealed, put it next to its friend. And then last one. These are now pre-shaped. They now need to rest so that they can become extensible enough that I'll get that nice long baguette. So I'm gonna cover them with a clean kitchen towel. This is just gonna go on there and we'll come back in like 20 minutes or so and do the final shaping. It's important throughout this process to to be considering the length of the baguette because once you shape it and it starts to proof, it becomes so filled with air, it's so delicate that it's like, it cannot really be handled very much, which is why we go through the extra trouble of getting this transfer peel. I'm going to use this for transferring the baguette and I'm going to put an upside down, just half sheet tray, which is 18 inches long, underneath my couche for proofing. Sprinkle a little bit of semolina flour 
on my parchment. Parchment is non-stick, of course, but when it's in contact with a wet dough, it actually can stick. So this little bit of semolina is just to create little grains of sand that the dough can kind of rest on. And now I think we're ready to move into shaping of the baguette. You can see that they've relaxed a little bit, so that means they're ready for shaping. So we wanted that gluten to like relax a little so that we can get that nice, long, extended baguette. So give yourself a little bit of flour on your surface. You don't want too much. I'm gonna use my scraper to sort of quickly and efficiently lift up the dough off the surface and flip it. So now what I wanna do, again, working with kind of floured hands, is like pat this down into a kind of rectangle. And I'm gonna take kind of like the top 40% of the dough, this strip right here, and fold it down, leaving a little bit of an exposed strip of dough on the bottom. Use your fingers to get it to, to stick. So now I have kind of two thirds up here and a third exposed here at the bottom, giving it a 180 degree rotation. And now I'm gonna take that top third strip of dough, fold it down into the center to make this kind of even midline. And what this is doing is it is stretching the dough over around onto itself and increasing tension because tension is what is going to give us that like beautiful, even cylindrical, long baguette. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold the dough in half, bringing this top half down, lining up with the bottom half and basically folding it at this seam. This part's a little tricky because you wanna seal that seam. You basically wanna go from one end to the other. One of the motions that make, you'll see bakers use is like using the heel of their hand to kind of like really form that seam. So what you wanna do is working with whatever is comfortable because I'm a lefty so I, I seal with my left hand and fold with my right. You basically wanna go from one end to the other and the most sort of efficient way to do it is to have your thumb be sort of positioned like at that midline seam and use your forefinger to fold down the top so that it's meeting right here along this bottom edge. So now I have the whole thing folded in half and I have this seam right here at the bottom. So you can see like I'm halfway to baguette already. So now it's time to really form that shape. And if you're getting any sticking along the length of the dough, you can push a little bit of flour underneath it with that scraper. And now you just wanna take the kind of meaty like palms of your hand and applying gentle pressure downward, but also kind of back and forth. And when I get to the ends, I like to actually like give it a little extra pressure to bring it to a point. So it doesn't take much pressure to get it to this 18 inch length. And so once you have it sort of rolled out, you wanna find that seam. So I have this seam running down the length of the dough. I'm going to now transfer this whole thing to my prepared couche, seam side up. That's really important. Let's see that whole thing again. Again, working on sort of this lightly floured surface. Scoop up the dough, turn it over, pat it into this rectangle, bringing that top 40% of dough down, sealing that seam, giving the dough kind of a 180 turn, bringing that exposed third of dough down now to create a center seam, pressing to make sure that seam adheres, and now folding the entire thing in half lengthwise. Here you see that seam. If you need to go ahead and give it a little more of a pinch. After you place that first baguette, you can see that I place it in the center of my couche. You're gonna make two pleats. This is making like a little cradle for it. It's gonna help to maintain this nice regular shape of the baguette, and it's going to make a barrier between this one and its neighbor. That second baguette is gonna go down right next to the first, getting it like all nice and cozy in there. And then the last one. So there's that seam. Okay, I'm gonna actually just fold the linen up and over, creating sort of like a little bit of support on either side of those outer, two outer baguette, and we are gonna let them proof. We are not going for a doubling in size. We're really looking for about like a 50% expansion in size. I would say generally, if you're at that kind of 75 degree ambient temperature, it's like 30 to 60 minutes, and for me, it's always been around like 45 is kind of the sweet spot. So excited, a little nervous, 
mostly excited. The baguette have been proofing in their little hammock for like 40 minutes. So I think we're there. I just wanna point out that I have a little saucepan here with some water that I just brought to a boil. It's just about a cup. I'm gonna use that for baking. So you can get your water going in a kettle or in a saucepan or whatever you have. It doesn't have to be actively boiling. Just bring it to a boil and then let it hang out. You just want it hot. I have my whole setup for the next step, which is slashing your baguette and then getting them into the oven. So here I have my piece of parchment with the semolina on it, which is on top of my board. Then I have my transfer peel, which we're finally gonna use, and my lom, that blade for making the slashes in the bread. So I'm gonna uncover my baguette. You can see the dough has really kind of filled out and like looks super plump. So here's the poke test. I'm gonna poke it gently and watch it sort of spring back. If it sort of springs back slowly and it holds a slight indentation, then we're good. First thing I wanna do is just separate the loaves, pull that fabric apart. So I have my baguette transfer peel right here. Sometimes I add a little bit of flour. I'm holding the peel with one hand and I'm using the fabric with my other and I am just flipping the dough onto my peel. This is a little bit sticky, so take a second for it to release. So now the seam is on the bottom. Now I'm going to slide this off of my peel and onto this prepared piece of parchment. You can kind of use the peel also to straighten it out. The slashing technique for baguette is to do mostly vertical slashes at really just a slight angle and then doing an odd number of slashes. So sometimes you'll just see like one long slash. I like to do five. You want to go quickly because the slower you go, the more it's going to kind of drag through that wet dough. All right, I'm going to bring this over to the oven with the water. So that's just going to hang out right here for a second while I load the dough. I'm going to get my thumb underneath this parchment so that I'm not holding it in place so it can just really gently slide off onto the baking stone. So you want to sort of position it all the way in the back and then like so. I'm going to grab that water. You want to slide that rack out a little bit. It's that blast of steam that is going to keep that dough kind of like pliable so that it can expand as much as possible in the oven. Whew. Make sure your heads look out of the way when you put that steam in there. I've had like my eyelashes like fused together from the blast of steam. I have about a minute to go on my timer. So that's that first 10 minutes where the baguette have been in at 500 with that blast of steam, which is super important in getting it to sort of get that like classic, super round baguette shape where those slits really open up. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the temperature down to 450 so it can kind of go the rest of the way and get a really well-developed caramelized crust. And I'm also just gonna like open the oven just for a second to let out any steam that's still kind of like moving around inside. Yeah, there's some, see that steam coming out? So that's good, so now we really want a dry heat to develop a nice caramelized crust. Ooh, so these are nice and bien cuit or well done. Just to use tongs. You definitely don't want to lift the baking stone out yet. Let that cool down inside the oven because it can crack also really easily if it has like big shocks in temperature. They look so good. I'm so excited. This one's my favorite. Look at the ear, look at the ear. They're super hot, so we're gonna let those cool, and then we're gonna come back and taste them. I just wanna point out some nice features about them. When you pick up a proper baguette, it should feel really light for its size because it's filled with big air bubbles. It is gonna be hollow sounding when you tap it. This one has really nice ear formation. You can see that as the bread expanded in the oven, the edges of the slash lift and peel back. This is what's called an ear. I can't decide which one I'm gonna cut, it, cut into. Maybe this guy. You can see I have these areas of nice, big, open crumb here. You have this super even, well-developed, crusty, but thin crust. So it's like a shell around this like delicious, soft, almost creamy tasting interior. So I'm just gonna taste it plain. Mm. To me, it's very classic baguette. Lots of super complex flavors in the crust because of how well done it is. It's just what I want with like that soft, somewhat chewy, but also tender interior and that light, crisp crust on the outside. It's so good. I think I'm gonna do a little jambon beurre, which is like a classic French ham sandwich. Jambon beurre means just ham and butter, but I am gonna add a little bit of mustard. Mm. 
Mm. It's so good. It's like a pretty cool thing to tell people that you made yourself. Thank you for watching. I love doing episodes of Try This at Home. We have more coming up for you. So if you wanna make baguette at home, which I really think you should, you can find this and other recipes at nytcooking.com.